Hello and welcome to Lightways with me, Anna Isabel. I'm a psychological astrologer as well as analytical hypnotherapist. And I am joined today by the wonderful Stephen Forrest. Hello, Stephen. <laughs> Hello, it's great to be back, Anna. I thought last time um, we talked about so many things, but the thing that we didn't get a chance to talk so much about was evolutionary astrology. So I thought there's a good reason to have you back. <laughs> that, that's my uh, my middle name. <laughs> exactly. So I thought maybe it might be good to begin with um, looking at the difference between your take on evolutionary astrology and say Jeffrey Wolf's Green, uh, Jeffrey Wolf Green's um, take on it. Yes, yes, that's a, one of my favorite questions, actually. Uh, uh, Jeffrey and I worked together uh, for about two or three years, maybe 20 years ago. We wrote a couple of books together. Um, philosophically, we're almost exactly the same. We, we, we believe in reincarnation. We think of it the way a psychologist would think of it, that uh, the uh, like a psychologist would imagine the traumas of your childhood shaping your present day personality. We don't argue with that, but Jeff and I would both agree that traumas from prior lifetimes also very similarly shape the issues that we experience in this lifetime. So uh, that in that we are exactly the same, Jeff and I. Um, <clears throat> we're both kind of scorpionic. Uh, when we started working together, they were, people were calling us the Pluto brothers. <laughs> sometimes respectfully, sometimes not, but but there it was. And uh, Jeff's uh, he's a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he has a kind of a fierce quality. Uh, I, I was lucky I didn't have to go to Vietnam, even though we're about the same age. Nobody would guess knowing us that I'm the one with the Aries moon and he's the one with the Pisces moon. <laughs> we seem quite the opposite of that. Um, so we, we held all that in, in, in common and in harmony. Um, technically, our approaches are, are really very different. Um, with the way we approach the actual analysis I'll just run through the distinctions for your astrologically savvy audience members. I won't be laborious about it, but uh, he uses Porphyry houses. I use Placidus houses. So the charts we're looking at are different. I use the mean lunar nodes. He uses the true lunar nodes. He makes a, a, a great focus of his work is the Pluto polarity point, the point opposite Pluto something I never pay any attention to. I don't disagree with them, but I just don't use it myself. Uh, we had one really telling moment when we were talking about possibly working together. There was a, a very fundamental difference between us uh, philosophically and our approach. And, and that was that to him, Pluto is, uh, is your soul. Pluto represents your soul. In my system, it doesn't. Uh, Pluto represents uh, a wound in your soul and some of the methods we can use for healing the wound, but I wouldn't go so far as to call Pluto the soul. And so that seemed like an insurmountable difference until Jeff came up with a, a line that I'll always remember. He said, under the patriarchy, all the souls are wounded. And I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were able to work together just on that basis. That was enough overlap between the, the two perspectives. Um, it, it, I haven't seen Jeff since uh, 2005. His, his health is not good. Uh, some of his people, uh, Pluto school members, began to feel that I had stolen evolutionary astrology from him. Uh, which is a wrong idea. The the uh, the notion essentially uh, we were kind of bringing it to the public, and then he disappeared. I was the only one left standing. It's so it's in my hands, but it's hardly evidence of stealing it. In in my opinion, um, for what it's worth, the last thing I'd want to do is argue about this. But but uh, I I use the term evolutionary astrology in my first book, The Inner Sky, which came out in 1984. 
Jeff used it in his first book, uh, Pluto, The Evolutionary Journey of the Soul, which came out in 1985. So you know, there's pretty strong evidence there that I beat him to the punch, you know, in print. But I'd quickly say a gentleman by the name of Ray Merriman used to be the president of ESAR, uh, titled a book, Evolutionary Astrology, that came out in 1977. So as far as I know, he's the one who originated the term. It's been around for a long time. So kind of a windy answer, one of my favorite questions. I think the thing is that ideas are in the air very often. Yeah, and absolutely. It's not unknown for people to pluck them out of the air. <laughs> roughly the same time um, in different parts of the world, unbeknownst to each other, it's something that happens rather frequently. And I think it's because ideas have a time of their own and then they find the channel through which they're going to be brought into the world. So it's, um, and as far as I can tell, uh, Jeffrey's work is alive and well um, through his school and his daughter um, who carries on and who I've had the pleasure of interviewing twice um, mm -hmm. well. So. I think there is room for lots of different perspectives. And I think, and heaven knows, we have many different perspectives on lots of different things in astrology. Okay, amen. And you, one of the biggest, the matter of the houses, you, you know, where you're using two different house systems. Yes. Um, so it's, so this is, not uncommon territory here uh, where astrology is concerned. I, I think I'm very interested in the, the idea of Pluto representing the soul or the wounded soul, because despite having read extensively um, Jeffrey Wolf Green's um, work as well myself, The idea of any one planet representing the soul seems alien to me. It does, however, feel right to say that the chart represents the soul and that there are certain things within the chart that really indicate something about the soul very strongly. And of course, the primary candidate for this would all would automatically be Pluto. Um, and you were talking about the wounds of the soul. And I would say completely and utterly. And, and yes, uh, Jeffrey's quite right that all souls are wounded. As um, a past life regressionist myself, <laughs> I've heard many a tale. Um, and, and some souls, you know, um, as I, as I hear my client recall different lifetimes, I kind of think, well, how much can one soul endure? Um, and then I realize, well, actually, that's the story of humanity and all of our souls. And perhaps because we're dealing with, uh, as regressionists, dealing with healing the trauma, um, of different lifetimes. We're not hearing about the easy lifetimes. We're only hearing about the, the traumatic ones. So there's all of that. But I, I think the question I want to ask you as I process everything you've said and, and think things through is what led you to Pluto as being such a, an important indicator of those wounds? In, in almost every case, the uh, mythology that is connected with the, uh, the god that uh, the planet is, represents ha has proven illuminating and helpful. There, there, there are uh, 
it's a classic illustration of the principle of synchronicity. So Pluto is named Pluto literally because uh, of Walt Disney's dog and a little girl was asked, the astronomer's daughter was asked, what shall we name this? And she says, Pluto. And I mean, you can't help but laugh and smile. And, and yet uh, the synchronicity is so perfect because Pluto is the Lord of the underworld, of course, to the Romans. With my clients, I like to say, and here's a loose translation of that, the God of hell. Pluto is the God of hell, the Lord of the underworld. And then the next step, you go to a, a, a simple church in the countryside and ask the pastor to speak to us of hell. Of course, it's one of their favorite subjects. And, and uh, they'll, they'll often say, hell is hot and it's buried under the ground. It's down there in folklore. And uh, you really want to avoid going there if it's at all possible. You know, th this is the basic uh, information about hell. And I'm smiling and you're smiling, but think about it. Is there a place universally in the human psyche that is so hot, we bury it and we don't wanna go there. Feel the light bulb lights over our head? There's Pluto. It represents the unconscious mind, the wounded dimensions of the unconscious mind. So what, what led me to my understanding of Pluto was simply that step of translation from the Lord of the Underworld. Been reading quite a lot recently about the um, the mythology around H Hades. Yes. So it, it wasn't always this vision of hell; that it was kind of the the place that you went to and rested before coming back, before the next incarnation. Yes. And yes. so it it makes me think again about about that link between Pluto and, and reincarnation um, as being very, very strong. It was where it, Hades world was the place you went to before yes. you came back. Um, I think I might not have made that very clear before. Yes, yes. But it's, it, was, um, it was just, so it seems obvious to me that we would be looking at Pluto as being very involved with reincarnation. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering where you feel the nodes fit in. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, I, I think that if we want to understand the, the unresolved karma that has ripened, in a, in a person, we look to the south node of the moon, its planetary rule or the aspects made and, and so on. Um, that, that sentence, the unresolved karma that has ripened is worth putting an asterisk by and then have, have a look at the asterisk. It's one sentence, but it says a lot. So uh, start off with what the south node does not represent. Uh, it does not represent a guided tour of all your prior lifetimes which would you know, paint the chart black. I, you know, we've had many, many prior lifetimes. It's the ones that uh, where something is left undone, something wounded us, something is unfinished, it can be something we got wrong. It can be something we got right, but got damaged in the process of getting it right. It can take a lot of forms. If evil touches us, if tragedy touches us, it, it leaves something unresolved. So unresolved karma, which is to say, therefore, there is always a significant negative component or hurtful component to the South Node is holding us back because it's unresolved. And then the other clause, unresolved karma that has ripened, that means it's going to manifest in this lifetime. You may have all sorts of rotten karma you're not going to have to deal with in this lifetime because you're just not ready. But here it's coming to get you. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. It will manifest in this lifetime. And as I put it that way, of course, it sounds like, uh oh, I wish I didn't have a south node. But we have to turn that around and say, no, this is good news that this karma has ripened because it's not doing you any good at all to have this unresolved karma. Isn't it wonderful that you are ready to deal with it in this lifetime. Doesn't mean it will be easy, but you're ready to deal with it. How? Well, the North Node comes into play there. So uh, kind of pursuing of the broader 
question here of Pluto in the face of the South Node. How do we distinguish them? I think that the South Node will really give you the key insights into the nature of, of the wound. And Pluto will give you some insight too, but it will also give you a lot of information about how to deal with the wound. So Pluto is uh, like a shamanic character. Pluto is like a, a, like a really good psychotherapist, you know? So we're gonna help you do the practical work of getting at the, at the issue. So Pluto and the South Node are, are in fact quite interactive. I think you're right about that. Uh, it's important, I think, to keep a, a clear distinction between the way each one works, the function that they serve. Listening to you, I was thinking about those moon's nodes, and I, I always teach that we are a work in pro in, in progress. We are a work yeah. in progress. I think with the nodes, it's we are a soul in progress, and um, and perhaps what the nodes are showing is the project, the soul's project for this lifetime, yes. and and within that is the imprint of the the stuff that we are carrying that we're going to have to sort through in the south node and then perhaps the north node the means by which we're the tools um some of them pleasant some of them less pleasant that we're yeah. going to be um using by virtue of the the fated stuff that happens to us so i think that's that's a I like that. I like the way that you, you put that. Are there any other parts of the chart that you would bring into consideration? Um, everything, everything, really. Um, I, I can defend that. It seems like an extreme statement, but, but I can defend it with one simple sentence. Uh, there's nothing in your chart that's there for random reasons, you know, period, end of story. And then I, I just add a, a little more logic to it. Uh, first, here's an irrefutable point. You've had your birth chart since the moment of your birth. <laughs> and so if there are reasons for you having the planetary positions you have, clearly those reasons had to occur before your birth. The chart is an effect of something that happened earlier. Uh, if, we, if we dismiss that idea, our, our only refuge is deciding everything is random and life has no purpose at all. And, you know, forget about it. I have no interest in thinking that way. So everything in the chart has its origins in a time prior to this lifetime. Um, that's not a proof of reincarnation. It, it works fine for me, but, but it, I, logically, I wouldn't call it a proof of reincarnation. We could reconcile that kind of astrology with the uh, heredity and genetics if we wanted to, you know, past lives uh, in the sense of your great, great, great grandmother who lives on inside of you, or were you your great, great grandmother? And maybe the critical point is what's the difference, you know, in practical terms, but the, the South node and everything else in the chart has its origins in the karmic past. I, I really feel that that's um, that makes sense. I, and I was thinking particularly about the the difference between the sun and the moon as the moon indicating uh, a past, uh, being more linked with the past, and the sun being more future oriented, as in the way that the self is growing and progressing as yes. we discover ourselves, whereas the moon being instinctive and always being, um, a part of us. And so I, I feel that those two also offer very big clues as to the, the mandate that we come in with, um, the our starting point, where are we starting um, emotionally, and yeah. then where yes. are we heading to? So yeah. that feels um, right to me. Also, by the time you take in aspects that involve Pluto, and the nodes, you're going to be pulling in quite a lot of the chart because mm -hmm. we well know everything is interconnected within yes. that. Yes, exactly. It seems to me that the more I think about this, the more I think about the chart as having many different layers. 
-hmm. and you can read it if it's possible to read anything in astrology superficially but you can read it mm -hmm. superficially yes or you could add layers of and layers of, of depth to it yeah so that the meaning behind it is always unfolding yes yes you can always go deeper mm. you mentioned uh, reading a chart superficially and you know uh, you said uh, you know maybe it's possible to read a chart superficially i think demonstrably it's easy to read a chart superficially just look at instagram or facebook <laughs> and, and uh you know it would be easy in in, in saying that to kind of get up on my high horse and look down at the at these tacky fashionista astrologers you know etc et um, and i succumb to that temptation from time to time i'd be the first to admit but a uh, beautiful thing about astrology is the way it, it adjusts itself to the level of the user it's like uh like reading uh, The Lord of the Rings, you know, you can read The Lord of the Rings when you're 10 years old and it's the best book in the world and you read it when you're 80 and it's more brilliant than you had imagined when you were 10, you know. Uh, great art, great great works of human creativity often seem to have that property of, of, of this uh, infinite elasticity in terms of the level of consciousness. So, uh, where can astrology carry us? Uh, it's carried me pretty far, but I, I'm sure I, I'm not even at the middle point yet. I love the way that we can come at it from different perspectives. I've been lately looking at charts through the perspective of the humors with the help of the lovely Wanda Sella. Um, and I'm, I'm so in love with that. And, and yet I'm in love with, I think just about every aspect of astrology because I, it happens coincidentally as I'm looking at humors with Wanda. I'm also looking at um, the wonderful work of Cornelia Hansen, who's been looking at humors from a modern perspective where she's calling its temperament and yeah. um, and her work with children in understanding in helping parents to understand the temperament of the children etc and so i'm looking at these two one is a modern take on the other and and yet there's such elegance in it all and so we can always look at things from different perspectives i love that you have your take on evolutionary astrology that's different from Jeffrey Wolf Green's take on it. And, and yet I see them like this, interwoven. Yes. Um, so it's, it's this beautiful, you know what it's like? It's like a crystal that depending on a, a clear quartz crystal, that depending on where you are and the light that's on it, you're going to see a different color. Yes, yes, exactly. I love that metaphor. Tell us a little bit about how, what is the, let's say, what is the first thing that you would do if somebody was coming to you for um, a greater understanding of their soul's evolution and they came to you for a reading, what would be the very first thing that you would do? The first thing I do, of course, is, uh, <clears throat> carefully study their chart, you know, before I open my mouth, before they, they knock on the door. And uh, when I first look at a chart, uh, I, uh, this is not me talking, this is me studying and preparing. I start with that south node of the moon. And it's like, and all its planetary correlates, you know, so what, uh, what is 
what is the wound in this soul? What is hanging this soul up? What have they come here to resolve? What karma has ripened? What are they ready to resolve? And then the North Node, and here's some pretty good advice about how they might resolve it. And this is big picture. This is looking at this person uh, where their physical body is just like one frame in a movie, and we're getting some sense of the whole movie here. And, and then my, my next step would be to start to look at the, at the actual chart, uh, sun, moon, and ascendant, often where I start. And what I'm looking for there is, okay, here's the vehicle that this soul has chosen to use in order to address this gigantic karmic drama that I've already kind of figured out. And then so work on how to tune that present personality, thinking how might the the delusions and hangups and bad assumptions and wounds of the south node distort this particular person's uh, nature or approach? How might it be made to serve the north node goals? So uh, that's how I prepare. Now, when I sit with a client, especially the, for the, the first time, my approach is very different. I leave the karmic stuff out for a long time. 99% uh, of the time, I look at that at the end. And uh, my reasoning here is that if I, if for example, I, I describe a person uh, as you know, like the fundamental issue of your life is confidence in yourself. Someone, lots of Saturn and second house structures or something. Fundamental issue is confidence in yourself. If the person is psycho psychologically honest, they know I'm telling them the truth. You know, and hopefully I advise them, I'm compassionate, I'm respectful, and all of that. So here's the key line. I am winning their trust, winning their trust. I'm not presuming their trust. I feel like it's appropriate for me to feel I have to win it. So I give them information that they can easily, readily validate from their own experience. Now, if on the other hand, I started out a session by telling somebody that they ran a, a chipper in Dublin in 1937 and they were killed in a terrorist bomb attack, you know, um, they can't prove me wrong. I can't prove myself right. I mean, they shrug their shoulders, you know, uh, who, who knows? So the reincarnational material, uh, basically, I want to win the person's trust before I presume upon their trust. So it's that psychological strategy that has led me to save the reincarnational stuff for last. One exception uh, being, or maybe two exceptions come to think of it. One, if a client comes in and says, uh, tell me about my past lives, you know, let's kind of cut to the chase, you know, if they're prepared for that, and that's what they want, I'll often begin, which I think often makes it clearer reading, actually. Uh, and then uh, sometimes the karmic stuff is just so incredibly dramatic that I feel I can't approach this reading without saying, hey, you know, judge, judge this as I, I put it out here and we'll see this karma has ripened, you know, so I'm going to tell you a past life story, uh, make of it what you will, but here's the proof of the pudding from my point of view. If what I tell you is right, about a prior lifetime, because this karma has ripened, you will see the effects of it in the present life. You will know if, if I'm right or wrong, at least in terms of the bottom line, and that is something you can verify. So I'll, I'll kind of put that piece of the puzzle forward. So are you saying that you glean a great deal of detail from the actual, of the actual story of mm -hmm. a past life Mm -hmm. through do you feel that you are working oh this is it's one of those questions it's almost like a chicken and egg question <laughs> in a moment <laughs> as i formulate <laughs> um do you feel that you are working purely objectively with the chart and the symbols within it or do you feel that you are also using intuition and that you are intuitively getting extra information that goes beyond the symbols in the chart. Mm -hmm. 
um, absolutely you can't do it without intuition. You know that that that's fundamental. Um, it's a it's a tricky area. I appreciated the look on your face when you raised this question. It's really a slippery one. So when I was a younger astrologer, you know, somebody would come to me for a reading and, you know, maybe because their wife or their girlfriend had asked them, you know, you know, to, to come or pressured them to come. So you get somebody coming, you know, with the attitude, you know, and, and uh, sitting there and I do a reading for them and, you know, honest people are, they're blown away. You know, this was really helpful and, you know, thank you. Thank you. This is amazing but they didn't want the stigma of becoming a person who believed in astrology. <laughs> they wouldn't quite say that, but I could read that that was what was going on back when there was more stigma connected with it. We've improved things. And so they would give me this conspiratorial look. Uh, you're pretty psychic, aren't you? And, you know, it took me a while to realize the trap they were laying for me. Like all I had to do was say yes, and they could dismiss astrology and say this Stephen Forrest is deluded. He believes in astrology, but he's actually psychic. It just doesn't know it. So I kind of sussed that one out with my scorpionic uh, insights, you know. And so I would become a little defensive about it. No, I'm not psychic. You know, <laughs> this is astrology. And, and then in... In support of that argument, which you, you can make a bit of a case, I do think intuition and, and all that are hugely important, but in support of the opposite argument, uh, I, I've written uh, computerized uh, report writers, you know, which will interpret your chart, just you input the data and, you know, outcomes, 15 pages of analysis. A lot of astrologers have, have done that. My reports have been successful. Uh, this is absolutely objective. You know, there's no intuition involved. The computer does it, you know, so there is a, a, a sound, powerful, theoretical system that is so logical, you can teach a computer to do it. And so we can't dismiss the, the uh, burn the midnight oil and learn how to actually do this stuff, you know, dimension of astrology. Don't take a two week course and get your business cards printed up. You know, there, there, is a, there is a certain studious element to this, which is logical and not intuitive. But then on top of that, any astrologer, uh, I mean, you're sitting around with astrologers and you know, pretty soon everybody's laughing about the amazingly psychic experiences that they've had where you know, they, they make up a story as an illustration and it turns out to be true. The, the one that, it's a, it's a story I don't often tell because it, it's it's so strange. But uh, in in America, everybody's got a number. It's called a social security number. It's you know many digits long, and uh, often your last four digits are uh, like a code that you'll use, like a, a PIN or something like that. So I'm doing a reading for somebody, and then story I had to make up a social security number for them. Last four digits, I made it up, and he says, "So my social security number is in my chart." I'd made it up right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and everybody I know in the field has an amazing story or two like that. Now, I didn't have the experience of psychically divining the last four digits of the social security number, but what the heck are we doing? What energies are we harnessing and participating in when we do this work? So it's a, I love your question. It's a, it's a fun one and it just ends dot, 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 you know? <laughs> It's not a question that I had, um, can, you know, planned on asking, but you, but, you know, having a conversation often leads us into directions we hadn't previously considered. And <laughs> it, when we we're talking about the level of detail that you are deriving from a chart about a past life. Mm -hmm. That made me think, no, this goes beyond the reading of the chart. There is something here that's more. Um, that is, the chart is opening something that I feel is, let's uh, let's use the word psychic. Um, and then there was something else that you said, that you were talking about the importance of providing evidence, which brings me into the area of mediumship. Because if you are a spiritualist medium, and it's called proof of survival, what you want to give. 
And so you are trained when you are linking with spirit um, who's coming in to speak to someone um, through you, your job is to provide evidence that is very clear so that the person knows, number one, you have a link, and number two, who it is that you are linking with. And yes. so, that, so that question of evidence is very important. And we kind of, I think, well, I certainly took it for granted when I first do it, started doing astrology, that what I said, people were going to understand and relate to. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, that would bring the credibility that was required for the session. And I would say that that, even in the early days, was there pretty much 100% of the time. You sometimes have a client who is not quite getting what you're saying, but then all you have to do is adjust the way that you're presenting the information and they yeah. go, oh yeah, that, yeah, I can see that now. I couldn't see it before, I can see it now. And we all recognize that. And I always felt that there was nothing subjective about the way I was reading charts, mm -hmm. that it was, the chart was talking to me. And this is of course the, the very early days. I now realize that there's, that that is, how can I put this? It's almost hubris to mm -hmm. think that it's just you reading these glyphs on a chart. And I realize actually that this very sacred work that we are doing does open the door for somebody to be working with us. Um, yeah. Call it guides, call, you know, because we're, we're wanting to help the person achieve their highest good. So somebody may well be working with us and listening to you um, just made me think, hmm, you're not alone, are you, Stephen? <laughs> no, no, never. I, I, yeah, I'm totally with everything you're saying. And uh, the, uh, I, I, I just add a, a kind of a Scorpio note. Um, just because somebody's dead doesn't mean they're smarter than you or wiser than you. You know, there, there's uh, on the other side of the veil, there is a diverse population and you have to watch which crowd you're running with. <laughs> Indeed. And I think that comes to uh, comes really very strongly with setting the intention. And yes. in the same way that I'm very particular about who I hang out with. <laughs> amongst those on this side of the veil, I would also be very particular, even more so <laughs> um, in who I might hang out with the other side. And so that comes down to having a very clear intention and you're working to the highest good of your clients as I am. And so this is a very important note to, mm -hmm. to make. Yes, comes down to, uh, like most of the great truths, it'll sound like a cliche. <laughs> you know, the great truths are not secrets, but uh, love. Love is, is, is the medicine. If, if you're approaching your work and your clients in a spirit of love, the, the help you attract is loving help that only wants the highest good for you as well as, as for the clients. But if you, if you have a Oh, I, I just insert a story. I was sitting with a group of people, actually some of Jeff's students, I was teaching a class for them years ago. And one guy was talking about a reading he had done for a woman and was clear he didn't like her. And, and he'd, uh, he, he talked about using the, you know, the analytic skills of, uh, of Pluto school work, or he could have used mine the same way and how he nailed her. He just really nailed her. And, and I had to say, well, let's think about that word for a moment. You know, let's think about our motivations. Are we doing this work to nail people? You know, and then just raising what I've just said up about four octaves. And I know you're going to understand that. I hope some of the folks out there in, in the, the land of Zoom can understand it too. I bet a lot of your people can. Um, 
If your aim is to nail people, what kind of help are you going to attract from the other side? Easy answer. You're going to attract spirits or beings in spirit form who are interested in hurting people, in nailing people, in dominating them, and being superior to them. That's the help you will get. And, and it will help you achieve exactly those ends. And of course, the word help becomes kind of ironic in that context. So love, love is the medicine. Love is our armor. Love is what protects us in this work. Also, the vehicle, the vehicle through which the in information is, mm -hmm. is, is brought in. So yeah. it's, um, it, does, it does always boil down to that um, because that is the intention um, that we are working with. So if we, if we have the highest, the intention for the highest good, then we are most definitely working from a place of love and compassion and empathy, um, yeah. which is the case. And it's not to say that everybody who walks through our door is somebody that we, we are immediately open to. Um, there are times when I encounter people who are very, very closed and mm -hmm. actually quite off-putting. If I'm, if I'm being brutally honest, they are mm -hmm. off-putting. Mm -hmm. But it's incumbent upon us to remember that that is a facade and that facade is what we have to gently pierce yes. in order to get through to the vulnerable, wounded part. So that hopefully we're then helping that person perhaps work towards a different facade. Yes, beautiful. Makes me think of, uh... I love the poet William Butler Yeats. You know, he's probably my favorite poet. And uh, well, he wrote a poem called Powdeen, and it's, a, it's about a nasty shopkeeper he encountered in Ireland. And, and the, the one line that I keep in mind so much in touch with what you just said, uh, there is not a soul that lacks a sweet crystalline cry. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful line? That everybody, no matter how dark or difficult they seem, there is a soul with a sweet crystal and cry in there. Absolutely. Well, we started off talking about evolutionary astrology. <laughs> How did yeah, we get we still here? Are. <laughs> <laughs> How did we get here, Stephen? Um, if people want to, okay, so it's a kind of practical question. But if people are starting off, on their journey as astrologers, perhaps mm -hmm. working with clients. And they're wanting to raise their game, to go to a level that's really kind of a healing level. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give them? Study evolutionary astrology. I mean, it sounds a bit partisan, but I. I, I, it's actually the best answer I could give. The, uh, all schools of thought in astrology purport to answer the question, what does my chart mean? Some of them do a better job than others, but they will all purport to answer that question. Evolutionary astrologers will do that too. But there's another question we answer, which none of the other systems do. Why do you have this chart? Not what does it mean, but why are you in this particular predicament facing these particular questions, glitches, possibilities, etc.? Why? And uh, as soon as we start including that perspective, that question, then astrology becomes a much more healing modality than it could be through simple description, mostly because unless we're talking about what needs healing, how can we possibly be doing any healing at all? And, and so this is why I'm so partisan to evolutionary astrology. Well, do you know what? I would agree. And I would agree because I <laughs> clearly, I'm a past life regressionist. It's part of, it's one of my wonderful tools um, yeah. for helping bringing healing. I'm an analytical hypnotherapist. 
the answer always lies in the past. Sometimes we don't have to go into past lives because the, the themes from those past lives are being repeated in this life and you unravel a trauma from this life and it just unravels all the way back in time. Yes. Um, and so it's not always necessary, but there are times when people spontaneously go there without me even attempting. Of course, there are people who come and say, I'd like to have a past life regression. Of course there are. Um, and then the question is, okay, why and what are you looking for? Um, but there are many times when I have people come in who have no knowledge or interest in past lives yeah. and end up somewhere that they did not expect to be. <laughs> yes. um, and so, the, and that's, that's their subconscious going, okay, this problem I'm having right now, it has its roots back there. And yeah. so that's where we're going. So it, it makes, it's an obvious thing for me to be looking at a chart as an imprint of the soul's mission for mm -hmm. this lifetime. Mm -hmm. but actually you know we're saying more than that because if we're saying we can read into the chart and find clues of previous incarnations then all this chart is is a moment in time yeah. in the soul's long long life and yeah. collection of life experiences yes. and that that's amazing yes yes it is it's wondrous i think of uh i, I love what you're saying we think very much alike um so karma is uh translates rather neatly into the word habit repeating patterns and so as you point out uh the past life trauma Maybe we don't use that language because it has repeated in this lifetime. And so we can deal with it in this lifetime or a previous one. And the, the nature of the karma is uh, not, uh, you know, some list of transgressions and each one needs to get paid for or something like that. It's, a, it's a basically encoded as an attitude, as an emotional state. So I, I always think of a, like a sine curve, you know, just one of those endlessly repeating waves. And some of the earlier ones are those are past lives, and and you know here's your your bad marriage in this lifetime, you know which reflected you know bad marriage for example in a prior lifetime, and the same patterns appearing. Um, this is all just echoing what you've said, but I want to add one more piece that's got me in trouble sometimes. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. It, it's that uh, another well, often another one of those sine waves is your birth you know what is the nature of the karma that draws you into this particular family this mother father siblings and so on it's just another manifestation of the same thing now if you if somebody generates liberating insights about their marriage you know okay flattens the curve you know all the way back you can hit any one of those things. You do a past life thing and it flattens the curve in the present. Just pop any one of them and they all go down, you know? Okay, so here, here's the piece as promised, the naughty piece that's sort of fun to say. Here's how as an evolutionary astrolog astrologer, I explain the success of uh, 20th and early 21st century psychology that it, it, psychology is quite effective. You know, it, 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 it helps people. Psychology in a nutshell is we can explain the difficulties of your adult life through an understanding of the traumas of your childhood. Okay, so go back and pop the wave in the childhood and all the other ones flatten out. And so the psychologists are actually doing past life uh, healing, you know, karmic healing without knowing it. <laughs> and that does not limit the effectiveness of their work. Their work can still be quite effective. Absolutely. It doesn't matter, you know, because if you if you think about it like a uh, a piece of, of yarn that's got tangled and knotted at different points, it doesn't yes. really matter 
which one you undo, it helps then to untangle um, the rest. And, exactly. and it's and sometimes of course it, it if you if the one that needs untangling is in the middle, it's quite tricky because you're having to, it to really work it because it's the the two the previous and the the after that are are being worked on simultaneously so it depends on which one you pick as to how easy it is but nevertheless it is going to impact on all of them so as ever we start off on one port in our conversation and we wander off into other lands and <laughs> arrive somewhere completely unpredicted which is of uh -huh. course the joy. I, I hope um, we're not we're not completely alone here, Anna. <laughs> well, I'm sure we have been able to keep many happy passengers. <laughs> Nobody. Yes, I hope so. Kill. I hope so. If if you're still out there, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I I I want to say thank you so much, Stephen, for such a a beautiful voyage of ideas and thoughts uh, that we've shared today and also the ideas and thoughts that you have shared with us over your whole career it's it's wonderful that we we have that Thank and you. if people want to continue to learn more through your work how do they do that oh one of my favorite questions of course uh, so my last name is forest with two r's so forestastrology.com uh, or forestastrology.center. My two websites, the .com, forestastrology.com leads you to my books and various recorded lectures and so on. It's kind of my website I've had for a long time. The uh, forestastrology.center leads to uh, my school, the Forest Center for Evolutionary Astrology, which is a, an online uh, three or four year program. We've currently, uh, we're just two years into the process now and we're doing pretty well. We've got a couple hundred students and uh, tutors and it, it's, it's a, if you're interested, forestastrology.center would give you all the details. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen. You're welcome. I know it's been a pleasure as usual and a, and a, a magical mystery tour. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for watching. Uh, next time, we're going to be looking at dynamic interactive astrology. And while you are waiting for the next edition of um, Lightways, do check out my website also um, as I am continuing the course Working with the Gods and looking at the outer planets very shortly. Until next time, goodbye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>